I'm Catherine Pompilio with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for April 16th, 2022. This week, Lawfare announced its new podcast series entitled Allies. The series, from Lawfare's Bryce Clem and the team at Goat Rodeo DC, tells the 20-year story of how the U.S. failed its eyes and ears, translators, interpreters, and other local partners that were on the ground in Afghanistan. For today's archive episode, the team at Lawfare picked an episode from November 2012. In the episode, Ratika Singh sits down with Stephen Tankle, an expert on insurgency, terrorism, the evolution of non-state armed groups, and political insecurity issues in South Asia, to talk about U.S.-Pakistani counterterrorism cooperation, his predictions for the end game in the war in Afghanistan, and Lashkar Utoiba. But first, here's a trailer for Allies. You can subscribe to Allies at a link in the episode description. After 20 years of war, the U.S. was getting out of Afghanistan. After consulting closely with our allies and partners, I've concluded that it's time to end America's longest war. It's time for American troops to come home. There are scenes of panic and pandemonium at Kabul airport today as desperate people pour onto the runway trying to flee the country. Shocking scenes of desperation and chaos in Afghanistan are being seen around the world. The withdrawal from Afghanistan ended in chaos at an airfield in Kabul. In the face of that mayhem, the military got thousands of Afghans who worked with the U.S. out. But despite the efforts of veterans, lawmakers, and senior leaders in the military, even more were left behind. Their fate was decided by which side of a wall they were on, and whether or not they had the right pieces of paper. Now. They live in hiding. We were the eyes and ears of U.S. troops in Afghanistan. The Taliban knew all this. That's why they used to shoot at them first. Why is it so hard to track the number of interpreters, translators, and contractors killed as opposed to U.S. soldiers? Because nobody wants to know the number. This show takes you inside their lives, the threats they faced, their attempts to escape, and the obstacles the U.S. government put in their way. I moved my family from location to location three times. There's no option for us. Some days they'll find you. He was just banging his head against the wall trying to figure out how do I unstick this. The problem was not the idea. The problem wasn't the legislation. The problem was the execution. Our story takes you from the front lines of the war to the halls of Congress to find out how did this happen? From Lawfare and Goat Rodeo, this is Allies, a podcast about how the U.S. government failed our eyes and ears, the Afghan translators, interpreters, and partners who fought alongside the U.S. Coming this May. Hello, and welcome to the Lawfare Podcast. I'm Benjamin Wittes. In today's episode, the latest in our series of interviews with people of non-legal expertise of interest to Lawfare readers, Stephen Tankle sits down with Ritika Singh to discuss U.S.-Pakistani terrorism cooperation, the endgame in Afghanistan, and lashkar e toiba Tankle, an assistant professor at American University and a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment in the South Asia program, is an expert on insurgency terrorism, the evolution of non-state armed groups, and political and security issues in South Asia. He has conducted field research on conflicts and militancy in Algeria, India, Lebanon, Pakistan, and the Balkans. His most recent book is Storming the World Stage, the story of lashkar e a timely look at one of the world's most complex and dangerous terrorist groups. I'd like to begin by um, asking you how you would describe U.S.-Pakistani cooperation on terrorism issues, both on the operational side of things and on the intelligence side of things. Sure. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to participate in this program. I think it's no secret, probably, to a lot of your listeners that uh, U.S.-Pakistani cooperation um, operationally and in terms of intelligence sharing has, has ebbed and flowed. Um, over time, and it's very hard to sort of get a fixed read on where things stand on a given day. Um, Broadly speaking, 
um, if one wanted to say from, from an operational or intelligence perspective, uh, one of the areas where Pakistan has shown itself um, capable and, and arguably committed is in terms of preventing um, you know, or seeking to prevent any large attacks outside of, of South Asia in, in terms of understanding it's not in their interests for you know, a Pakistan-based group to attack the United States, for example. And since Mumbai, there has been an effort to try to rein in those groups that could stage large-scale attacks in India as well. And so there has been uh, intelligence sharing going on, as far as I understand it, um, you know, in those instances. Um, but otherwise, it, it, as I said, it, it, it ebbs and flows and sometimes can be somewhat ad hoc. Um, and from an operational perspective, of course, um, you know, the, the U.S. has increasingly sought to act unilaterally. So whereas in the past, uh, information would be shared in terms of drone strikes far in advance, increasingly that became something that the U.S. would do, um, you know, independently on its own. Now, there are discussions back and forth about how to... Um, to re-engage, um, you know, the Pakistanis would very much like for the drones, well, they would very much like for them to end, but at the very least, what they would like would, would be um, greater sharing of intelligence, greater cooperation, and privately what they say is what we really want is, you know, they'd like the technology and they'd like to be able to put their, pl their flag on the plane. That's unlikely to happen. Um, but, you know, those are areas where I think we're continuing to explore greater operational cooperation. Like you just said, the United States has opted to act unilaterally instead of sharing a lot of operational mm -hmm. intelligence. So to what extent do we have the Pakistanis' consent for the operations that we conduct there? Uh, Again, a very tricky question. A very tricky question. You know, uh, we certainly don't have their public consent, um, and that's, that's most clear in terms of, of drone strikes. Um, they publicly condemn them. Uh, they have yet to shoot down a drone. Which they could do. Um, what would happen if they did? Well, Just and that's and that's right, and that's the issue is to say that we have their consent. You know, there was the infamous, uh, you know, WikiLeaked, uh, you know, m memos, you know, a couple years ago um, with with General Kayani privately, you know, sort of going along with a lot of this, and of course uh, President Zardari saying, you know, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, we are not so concerned about, um, you know, civilian you know, casualties, that you may be concerned about that, but we understand you'll do what you have to do. Uh, but, but there's a difference between that kind of consent and perhaps, you know, not shooting down a drone, which is to say they haven't closed their airspace and they haven't shot down a drone, um, but that's, you know, it's very difficult to get a read on whether that's because they are still on board with the drones uh, ever so quietly or because that is crossing a red line. Um, with the U.S. and they understand that, you know, for all our talk that we don't necessarily have leverage over Pakistan, um, the Pakistanis see themselves as having even, you know, in some instances, less leverage vis the United States, and that is certainly one of them. Um, now, another area where, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's, to my mind, and of course we don't know what's going on behind closed doors, um, you know, very, very little operational coordination and, and, and has been for some time is in terms of uh, any of our trainers or officers on the ground who could work with Pakistani forces in the tribal areas or what have you. Um, you know, and that is an area where um, they, they, I think, have increasingly put their foot down. One of the issues with, with Raymond Davis, as far as I understand it, mm -hmm. um, you know, was the, the Pakistani security establishment, I think, feeling as though or believing as though they had perhaps let the Americans in more than they wanted to, or the Americans had gotten more of a foothold than they, they would have liked the U.S. to have had in terms of intelligence presence on the ground oh, yeah. and ability to operate somewhat unilaterally. Um, and there's been a real pushback against that. How stable, then, would you say Pakistan is? What degree of control, I guess, does it have over its territory? You know, and I'll take the, the control over territory first. Okay. Um, it's certainly the case that there are, and I don't think it's any secret, that there are areas in the tribal areas that are still no-go areas for the Army and the ISI. Um, and that is certainly troubling. Those are areas where they, they don't have, not only do they not have control, but it is sometimes difficult for them to actually travel. 
um, and that is places in their own country that their own armed forces may not be able to travel to. Mm -hmm. That is very problematic. Mm -hmm. Beyond the tribal areas um, and the and the you know in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, um, there there are you know I think it's arguable no places where they can't necessarily travel within the heartland, but. And not to be too academic about it, um, you know, this then gets into the question of what it means to control territory. Um, you know, one definition of that is to say that that you exercise an, enough of a monopoly of force and you have, you know, enough governance cap capacity that others cannot necessarily outcompete you in certain areas. And, and it's arguable that in areas of Punjab, in, you know, in, in sections of Karachi on any given day, there are non-state actors that can outcompete the authorities mm -hmm. in some of those instances. And so I do think that you look at islands of instability, and that comes back to that, that stability question, mm -hmm. islands of instability, islands uh, where there's not the hype of control that there could be. And, and not to go on too much longer on this point, but I would also suggest that it's not just what they do or do, don't control today. Mm -hmm. It's that question of whether they could keep that control on a pinch. Um, and I'll give two examples. Okay. Uh, one is very recently, of course, the the you know publicly declared holiday on Friday, um, you know, to enable protests where they very quickly lost control, um, you know, and, and were unable to sort of hold back, um, you know, crowds and, and of protesters without exercising very lethal force, mm -hmm. and just simply the fact that there was this feeling of the uh, 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 of feeling compelled mm -hmm. to give this holiday is troubling either because it means that they felt that they weren't going to be able to limit the violence any other way or because they felt so threatened by these actors that there was the need to give a stop to them. And the other example, um, you know, is the oft-cited reason for not uh, moving against some of these, uh, what I would call, establishment groups like Lashkar Daiba that have a presence in Punjab. Um, even the accommodations with groups like Sipi Sahaba um, there's concern about what would happen if there was a huge backlash in the settled areas and you can't bring the army into Punjab province. Well, if that is your fear that the police wouldn't be able to counter this, then that control is very, very tenuous at best. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, that's, and that's a concern. And that goes to the wider stability questions. Um, I'm not one who thinks that Pakistan is a failed state by any means. Um, and I, you know, I always question what it means to say a state is failing. Um, there are mm -hmm. so many different metrics that we could use. Or a rogue state. Right, or a rogue uh, state. I mean, although in that regard, they certainly engage sometimes in behavior. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that, that, that the U.S. would, would, would view as, as very troublesome. Um, but, you know, from a stability perspective, um, there are, as I said, there are islands of instability, um, you know, and and stability ex exists on a spectrum, and I think it's it's far less stable than, than Pakistanis um, and the U.S. Would, would like it to be on any given day, um, you know, although far more stable than those who think that Pakistan is going to implode tomorrow. Right. So what are some of these barriers then to stability? You've spoken about systemic issues, you've spoken about structural issues, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on this a little bit for our listeners. One set of actors that, that is contributing to this instability, obviously, is, is um, you know, our, our, our militants. And then, you know, I've talked a lot about, and I've, I've you know, writing now about barriers to action against right. militancy. Um, and, and there are a number, as you alluded to, um, these sort of structural barriers, which I divide into capacity shortfalls. Um, the police are under-resourced, under-trained, underpaid, and deeply politicized. And by the way, the, the politicization of the police and of the uh, military, though, in different ways, that in itself, um, you know, is a feeder of instability, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But it is also a barrier to action against militancy. And these are local um, police forces. In these are local police forces. Yes, although one, you know, arguably the internet, the intelligence bureau, and in, in the, you know, in the FIA, these are also entities that have been politicized at times, sclerotic at others. Um, then, of course, in, in addition to capacity shortfalls, you have systemic issues. 
again, politicization is one of them. You also have lack of cooperation between the federal government and, and the provincial governments okay. um, at times because you have different parties in power and so they are competing against one another. Um, you know, and, and this is the type of competition that makes uh, demo Democratic and Republican sort of, you know, um, fighting here look tame by comparison. Um, mm -hmm. You also have entities that are not tasked for counterterrorism, like the ISI engaging in counterterrorism, at times because they are the most capable, um, at other times uh, because they seek to uh, close off space for the civilians so they can maintain control uh, over, you know, sort of this portfolio. Uh, that makes, uh, you know, executing CT within, you know, the bounds of constitutional law very difficult. Right. Um, the legal infrastructure there is quite weak, um, you know, and, and the fact that you have uh, ISI, police, etc., all competing with one another, different actors engaging in um, practices that are extrajudicial, that taxes the system, and it's a system in which there's no witness protection, there's no judicial protection. Um, you know, I think, you know, as low as 15% of the cases that are heard in anti-terrorism courts, which are special courts, actually result in conviction. Wow. You have cases that should be heard in anti-terrorism courts that aren't. You have cases that shouldn't be heard in anti-terrorism courts that are. So these are all structural barriers, and that's before one gets to the fact that, let's be honest, PacMill ISI continues to play favorites with regard to those militants that it goes after and those that it doesn't, and that creates operational barriers to action. There are perceptions in terms of security, um, that fear of blowback that I mentioned, because we fear that we won't be able to keep control, or we're going to kick the can down the road. Right. All of these create barriers to action, and what that does is it opens up space for militants to, you know, to, to expand uh, you know, their roots um, throughout the country mm -hmm. and act as a force of instability. We've heard a lot about cyber security this year. Um, you know, this the State Department's legal advisor just made this whole speech mm -hmm. about the United States or the government's position on cyber attacks. So what do we know about Pakistan's cyber capabilities? I don't know a lot. I know that they, they seem to have the capability to try uh, to... Um, to, to bar access mm -hmm. to sites like YouTube and Facebook, um, but they either don't have the uh, capability and capacity or don't have the uh, desire um, to bar, to, to shut down a lot of websites that belong to militant groups. Mm -hmm. um, that's problematic. But in terms of their capacity to launch cyber attacks, um, I, that is outside of my field of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and then in, with regard to Al-Qaeda, could you please explain the relationship between Al-Qaeda and some of the jihadist groups? So, um, I mean, Al-Qaeda obviously has a, a long history in the region. It was actually formed back in 1988, it, not in Afghanistan, but in Peshawar in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, and it's had a relationship with the Haqqanis for a very long time, and it's had a history with a, a number of these other groups as well, shared training um, camps in Afghanistan during the 1990s. Um, it was close to elements of the Taliban movement, although there was debate within Taliban uh, prior to 9-11 and right up until the, the U.S., invasion after 9-11 about whether or not to forsake Al-Qaeda. Um, all of which is to say that it's got a very complicated relationship with a lot of these different actors. Um, the Haqqanis have acted as a sort of force multiplier for Al-Qaeda in that, you know, as has the Turkey Taliban Pakistan, yeah. um, which by the way are two, you know, come together in fighting in, in Afghanistan, but, you know, have very different organizational policies with regards to attacking Pakistan TTPs. Enemy number one, the Haqqanis are, you know, a nominal ally. Right. Um, although, you know, one hears rumblings that, you know, if the Pakistanis had the opportunity to sort of break with the Haqqanis and they felt comfortable doing so, um, you know, that's something that they may want to explore, but, you know, as they see it from a real politic perspective, now is not the time. Mm -hmm. In any event, both because of the territory that they control in Fatah, um, provide space for Al-Qaeda, safe haven, um, you know, place for training camps, etc. That enables Al-Qaeda to survive. So, whereas the Pakistani state is opposed to AQ, 
Um, these militant groups definitely cooperate. These militant groups definitely cooperate, and some of those militant groups are supported by the by the Pakistani state. And so you have this very odd, um, very difficult to unravel, you know, sort of almost Gordian knot in which the Pakistani state will be supporting one militant group that will be, you know, um, collaborating, cooperating with, uh, so militant group A, the Haqqanis, cooperating, collaborating with militant group B, Al-Qaeda, that is attacking the Pakistani state, mm -hmm. which is, you know, and it, it, if one were to try to uh, draw this on a map, it would be very difficult because you're talking about so many different groups and so many interrelationships. The TTP is a very broad, you know, movement. Some are more pro-state, some are more anti-state under that umbrella. Some cooperate very closely with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, in turn, has acted as a force multiplier for these entities right. in terms of propaganda, in terms of, you know, strategic, tactical advice, etc. Um, so it's a, it's a give-and-take relationship. Um, one that I would describe overall, just to sum up, um, all of these groups exist in a state of what I say is separateness and togetherness, okay. which is that there's competition um, on some days, collaboration, cooperation on others, um, and it's a spectrum. Let's transition a little bit to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. With the surge now over, the surge troops left, mm -hmm. I had their deadline. Um, does the authorization for the use of military force become any less plausible or powerful? Um, as a justification to continue our operations and our drone strikes in Pakistan, because you know our our war with its neighbor um, is now ending. The war in Afghanistan is is winding down. I mm -hmm. wouldn't say that it's ending. There's a an agreement to keep you know some unknown number of U.S. troops in Afghanistan for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, one of the more troubling aspects is obviously the suspension of joint patrols and training at uh, the lower levels. Um, you know, one talks about the potential for that to be reversed at some point. Right. Um, you know, absent doing that, that obviously removes, you know, sort of the main pillar of the strategy going forward right now. But it, even if those troops aren't necessarily doing what they're, many of them were there to do, they're still there. And we, we will have likely a residual force of some number in Afghanistan for, this, for the foreseeable future. Um, what that will mean in terms of um, authorization for use of force in Pakistan. My understanding is that you know some of these are the result of presidential findings that were expanded, um, you know, over time, but that resulted after 9/11. Although you know I am not a lawyer, and this is not something that I follow uber closely. Um, and my sense is that in terms of particularly drones, um, that will be dictated by the by political calculation and operational utility and need as opposed to by you know how many soldiers are next door in Afghanistan yeah but what effects um, do you think that the the troop drawdown will have on some of these Pakistan based uh, jihadist groups I mean and that's the million dollar question right, right. Um, and nobody nobody has the you know the I don't I, I'm yet to hear anybody who, who has a hundred percent certainty of that answer and if Anybody had 100% certainty of that answer, I'd be very skeptical of it. They probably be wrong. My yeah. sense is that the the drawdown in 2014, um, one of the consequences that it will have is that you you already have a lot of groups with a lot of different agendas. Right. Some are um, in favor of revolutionary jihad against Pakistan. Others are opposed to it and think that the focus needs to be on Afghanistan. Others think the focus needs to be on killing the Shia. Other think, others want to go back to fighting you know, against India. It's already difficult for all of these groups to come together and unite behind any one cause because they have so many disparate agendas. And I think that that will be amplified by the post-2014 drawdown. So it will be even more difficult for them to achieve critical mass. And so in that regard, you know, that is a potentially net positive. The, you know, the, the, the ugly, under, ugly underbelly of that is that, you know, although they won't be able to necessarily achieve critical mass in any one direction, um, as they become more disparate, it's even more difficult to sort of track all of these different actors, you know, and know where any one entity is going to focus on any one day. And, you know, you have the potential for ratcheting of violence as people are competing with one another. And then, of course, the other factor that one, one needs to acknowledge is 
you know, the fact that some of these actors will see the U.S. drawdown as a victory, um, you know, uh, and and will want to sort of then uh, to pursue greater objectives, not just in Afghanistan, but also in Pakistan. I mean, that is an oft-cited concern, is, is some of these actors will then, you know, turn inwards with even greater, uh, you know, vengeance. Uh, I also think it's important when talking about these groups um, just to highlight an, an operational issue, which is the U.S., uh, you know, we tend to perceive the issue of safe haven in Afghanistan as safe haven from us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also important to remember that even for some of these groups, even pro-state groups, like the Haqqanis or like Lashkar Taiba, safe haven also means safe haven from the ISI. It means that you can keep your relationship with the Pakistani state, but that you have a space in which you can operate with a greater degree of plausible deniability. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so that attenuates, potentially, um, ISI influence. And I, I say influence because I'm opposed to the concept of control. I think control over any of these entities is an illusion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that can have important ramifications as well. I'd like to talk about LET just a little bit. A few basic questions first mm -hmm. for you. Um, how big would you say it is, and how would you define its objectives? Um, we're, we're being audio recorded, so you can't see me give a shoulder shrug in terms of the, <laughs> um, the size of the group. Estimates on LET size are very difficult, again, not to be you know, too academic -y about it, but because of how we define membership. Um, if you're saying men under arms right now, you know, I've heard estimates from you know, two to 4,000. But if you're talking about people who have gone through training, then you're getting into the, you know, Tens of uh, you know 10, 20,000. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have to ask what kind of training? What does that mean? Does it mean that they've gone through Dari i Amma, which is the general training? That's three weeks, uh, right? Yeah. Does it mean that Dari i Sufa, that's primarily religious indoctrination? That's also two to three weeks. Dari i Khafsa, that's the special training. That's two and a half to three months of guerrilla training. Right? Do they go to additional urban warfare training, you know, programs after that? Um, and did they stay with the group? So it's a it, that's we get into that question of what it means to say somebody who's gone through training, what it means to be a member. Right? There are people who are members of the above ground Jamaat Dawa, which is Lashkar's. That's their above ground social welfare organization. They run a dispensary. <laughs> right? I mean, now that person probably went through the general training and the religious training, but is that person going to, that person under arms. I mean, you may have to worry about them giving, you know, sucker to somebody who is a militant, but are they a militant themselves? Um, so it's very difficult to get a, size, a sense of size. And I think that is actually one of the important, um, one of the most important points about Lashkar. It is, it is a variegated organization um, where different people have different roles. Um, you know, and so from hardcore militants to people who have some sort of tangential affiliation, it's a quite a broad spectrum. Um, and so we, we need to really have a, a very good understanding of what roles those different actors can play in terms of the level of threat. Um, so that, that is uh, its size. Your other question was? Uh, just how would you define its objectives? It, its objectives? Um, to me, I've always understood LET um, based on the, the dualities um, that, that define it. It is a missionary and a militant organization, which is to say that it um, one of its key objectives is promoting reformism in Pakistan. Um, it believes that Pakistan will not be complete, will not be a true, truly achieved its its uh, its its final you know sort of stage of development until it is a, a purely Islamic state. Mm -hmm. And it pursues that primarily nonviolently, but at the same time, it's also a militant organization. And as a militant organization, it is primary pan, primarily pan-Islamist, mm -hmm. um, which is to say that it wants to liberate occupied Muslim lands around the world um, and protect all Muslims around the world. Now, much like Al Qaeda's. Uh, well, yes, uh, Al Qaeda is also pan-Islamist, although Al Qaeda has always primarily focused on the U.S. Right. So they're global jihadist, in which they say um, we want to. Uh, liberate occupied Muslim lands, but, you know, Bin Laden's whole thing was, but the first thing we have to do is defeat America. Mm -hmm. And then we can get to liberating all these Muslim lands. Whereas uh, Lashkar will say, look, our primary, our, our primary objective in the medium term is to liberate all Muslim lands. And if that means fighting America, because America is occupying them or putting Muslims under threat, then we will, but we'll fight others as well. And for Lashkar, of course, you know, historically, India mm -hmm. has been primary, been, been enemy number one. 
um, and that's for a host of reasons. It's because Kashmir is part of Pakistan in their perspective, so, you know, Kashmir needs to be liberated first. Mm -hmm. um, it's because, you know, this is primarily a Punjabi organization, and so a lot of people have memories of partition, and, you know, India is history, you know, th that has been inculcated, you know, in them, and, and they see India through that prism. Um, it's because India controls other territory, like Hyderabad, which mm -hmm. is part of the Indian, kind of, you know, Indian state that Lashkar thinks is Muslim land under occupation. Mm -hmm. It's because there is a historic blending of anti-Hindu communal sentiment in Pakistan with pan-Islamist sentiment, and Lashkar is a product of that. So right. all of these things feed into that 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 prioritization of, of India as enemy number one. Mm -hmm. How has the organization, in your view, evolved over the over the last few years? You know, I mean, since the 2008 attacks, where it really kind of was on the U.S.'s radar screen more so than ever before. Yeah, I think there are a couple of important points here. The first is that Hafez Said is increasingly taking a public role, um, you know, which one could either see as, as evidence of, you know, the Pakistanis' inability to or unwillingness to, to control um, you know, uh, their militants, or as sort of trying to create space for him mm -hmm. um, to be active there as a means of venting some steam. Um, you know, we're going to give you a bit of a seat at the table, and so therefore maybe you're not going to launch another attack that almost gets us involved in a war, right? And you're yeah. not going to launch attacks in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. You know, the other issue is in the lead-up to, to Mumbai, the Lashkar guys were beginning to come involved in attacks in Pakistan, which, you know, they never admit they're organizationally opposed to that. Mm -hmm. But it was happening nevertheless. Everybody knows. Right. It was happening nevertheless. Um, so that's one, I think, important evolution is, is Hafez Said's increasingly public role. Um, you know, and the fact that Jamaat Dawa was allowed to relaunch its website recently is still not a banned organization. Right. Is beginning, being given increasing space on the above ground side, right? So they're able to pursue that objective. The flip side is at the same time, they've also ramped up their activities in Afghanistan uh -huh. um, since 2010, roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would argue that this results from the army and the ISI trying to regain influence over the organization after Mumbai and after some of these guys have become involved in attacks in Pakistan. And one way of doing that is, again, creating another place for them to vent their steam. So even though they've been in Afghanistan since the middle of the 2000s, their numbers grew. Um, and, and I would argue that this has the potential to create tensions within the organization. If this were ever to come to a head where you have some people wanting to reorient towards India, some mm -hmm. people saying, hey, look, we just drove the Americans and their, you know, sort of vision out of Afghanistan and wanting to pursue that line, and others saying we want to continue to sort of grow our power base within Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, Lashkar Taba hasn't been forced to choose from among, you know, those different dishes, but if it were, that could create tension within the organization. I'd like to end um, by asking you, you know, there was so much recent controversy and press over the designation of the Haqqani Network mm -hmm. as a foreign terrorist organization. And it seems to me that Lashkar is a good data point for this conversation. Um, so in your view, what effect did the designation have on Lashkar? And, you know, will, it, will designation have the same kind of effect on the Haqqani Network? Um, you know, it, it was, it, it made their operational environment a bit more difficult. Um, it makes bringing in money from overseas a tiny little bit more challenging. It makes, you know, running those logistical networks, running those financing networks, operating abroad, it makes it a little bit more challenging. It constrains their environment. It is not, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back in any way, but it's not intended to be. It's supposed to be sort of, you know, the, the you know, another stone to sort of try to, to weigh it down as it continues to move forward. And I think that that's what we can expect, is that, you know, that, that, that this will maybe constrain the Haqqani's environment a bit. It's not going to finish them off, but it's not designed to. Um, it's supposed to slow them down a little bit. Um, because, you know, after trying many other avenues uh, to get, you know, uh, other actors to slow them down, that was not successful. And so, well, if we don't lose anything, and there was this perception that the Haqqanis were, you know, not going to be um, amenable 
to you know to to, to uh, peace talks and you know that they were not that that, that was my, my understanding is that there was the sense that they, they were not that was not a big enough potential cost to stop you know sort of some of these minimal benefits thank you Stephen uh, for taking the time to do this I uh, really pleasure. appreciate it Thank you for listening to the Lawfare Podcast, a project of the Harvard Law School Brookings Project on Law and Security. Our music was performed by Sophia Yan.